right here, we're ready to go. What I want to do is just start playing around with drawing different types and shapes and sizes of stairs. So what I'm going to do as a starting point is just take a first floor level, put a floor down just so we can take a look. I'll just make some big arbitrary floor right now. The precise dimensions aren't going to be very critical for what we're doing right now. I'll finish that floor. Then I'm going to go up to the second floor level. I can see the first floor level kind of through. But what I'm going to do is, again, go to the floor tool. I'm going to put another floor oh, just a little bit further back. I want to kind of leave this one standing off of the first floor a little bit, kind of like there's a little balcony space or something like that. I want to give myself some space for the stairs. Okay, so so far all we've done is created just two different levels. Nothing too awfully exciting there. Okay, the idea is what I want to do is now go through and connect that first floor to the second floor level. And as I do that, one of the most critical things I have to think about is really what the height relationship is between those two different levels. There is some number of inches between those two. And what I'm going to have to do is actually go through and just based on that number inches, Okay, go through and divide it up into a set number of increments, really based on how tall each of those different increments can be. Okay. By default, okay, the residential tool is typically set up with a stair where you can have up to seven inch in each of the different increments. Each riser can be up to seven inches. Now that's actually a little bit smaller than what code allows. Code will actually allow you to do up to eight inches. Okay, but whatever you choose as the maximum that you're gonna allow is really gonna determine how many different rises is necessary. So I'm going to start by just going ahead and doing these seven inch tall stairs. Okay, later I'll show you how we can actually increase that, make it eight inches and have a steeper stair. And the reason sometimes I like steeper stairs is if the stair is steeper, okay, then it doesn't take up as much room. Yeah, sometimes I just don't have enough room to have a very long stairway. And usually actually one of the most critical things we have in terms of difficulties in putting stairs in is trying to fit them into the small space that's available. Okay, I'm going to go to the first floor level. I will start drawing some stairs by choosing the stair tool. Once I've chosen the stair tool, I can take a look at the stair properties. I'm pretty much going to leave them alone for right now, but I go from the first level to the second floor level. Those are my top and bottom constraints. Way down here, you can actually see this issue of the number of risers. And for this staircase right now, it's showing me that it's suggesting 16 risers. That's based on that maximum seven inches. It couldn't quite sort of get a, you know, 16 would make it work. What will happen is I can change that number of risers. I can almost always increase the number of risers because as I increase the number of risers, what it does is it just makes the riser height lower and lower. So I'm sort of making the stair flatter and flatter. What I can't do is the opposite direction, or at least not unless I start changing the parameters. If I go back to 16 again, if I try to get down to 15, it's going to complain to me. It's going to say, hey, you know, if to do 15, I'd have to make something that's over 7 inches. And right now, you're not saying I'm allowed to do that. So keep it at 16 for now until you tell me otherwise. OK, OK to that. Okay, when it comes time to draw my stairs, what I do is I look up here and I have this notion of a run line, boundary lines, and riser lines. And the run lines is where we're going to start. The run lines is really just this imaginary line right down the center of the stairs. And if I go pulling, you'll see as I go pulling, okay, it's going to show me basically where the stairs are going to be and also report to me the number of risers that have already been created, as well as how many more are still are necessary to complete the stair. So to get 16, I really have to pull all the way out to here. Okay, When I choose all 16, or when I place all 16, notice now I'm actually looking at the blue line. That's the run line. Okay, I have the green lines, which are the boundary lines. And each of these different black lines is a riser. That's the face of a stair. Okay? And for right now, we'll just say OK and accept that. But we'll talk about how to change all those in just a minute. I'll finish the stairs. When I finish the stairs, it goes ahead and actually creates a stair object that has rails on each side and has stairs in the middle. It's sort of pointing up from the bottom here. Okay. Notice it has this thing, it's like a cut line halfway through. And what that's all about, that's actually, if you think about the plan view being cut at four feet, okay, that's where you'd actually cut the stairs. 
Okay, so anything above my head, it's showing to me as a dashed line. Anything below me, it's showing, or below that line, it's showing as a solid line. So you go, great. Yes? Actually, I think it. I think it's ten feet. But yes. It's not like your goal is the default is ten feet. No, no, exactly. I think the way I just did it there, based on level one and level two, let's just check it. So I'm not really sure. Let's take a look at it. What it was set it to by default. It looks like when I place the floors, the floor to floor height is actually nine feet. Very good guess. Okay, so that must be about four and a half feet right in there where it's splitting it. Okay, so nine feet. So times 12, what is that? That's 108 inches. Then we divide that up by 7 inches, and that's why we get the number of risers that we have. OK. Now I've placed my stair here. It's kind of looking OK. Let me look at it in 3D. You notice it's sort of away from my uh, floor right now. So if I want to pull it close to the floor, I can do this. I can go to the second floor. And in the second floor view, I can do all sorts of things. I can choose that stair object. I can move it. Let me zoom on in so I can get a little bit closer. A good way to move it is to grab the head of the stairs and just move it directly right over and sort of touch the edge of the floor. Another way I can move that is, actually notice on the second floor level, the line says down now as opposed to up, because we're looking at it from the other direction. The other thing I can do to it is, oh, I could use the align tool. So I could say modify and align and choose that edge and choose the edge of the stairs. I can align them together and even lock them together. Okay, And that's kind of a nice way to do it. When I get done doing those, okay, everything should be locked up and looking pretty good. Now, the nice thing about locking the top of the stairs to the floor is that if the floor edge changes, the stair is going to follow it. OK, and we like that. Now, another way to do this that's very, very helpful is, you know, it's, as I'm placing the stairs, if I'd like to sort of be aware of where that edge of the second floor is, just so I can use that to help me position the stairs, I can still adjust, but at least get it in the right neighborhood. Okay. What I can do is as follows. I can go back to the first floor plan. It looks like it's just sort of hanging in space there right now. And that first floor plan actually has some view properties. And we're going to learn a lot about view properties over the next few days. In the view properties, one that's very helpful is this idea of an underlay. The underlay is almost like, oh, it's just something that lets us see through to another floor level. So I can underlay the second floor. What it does is it puts the second floor lie in there. It's a little bit grayer. But it's just helpful for me. I can, it's like seeing through. I can see above my head and below my head at the same time. And that helps me line things up. So once I've placed the stairs, I can select the stair. If I happen to have put it in the wrong direction, I can flip it. Let me just choose it. I can flip the orientation of the stair. Let us flip it back and forth. Let me come back over here. I'll be flip it back the other way. The most common mistakes I typically make when I first place stairs is I either get them drawn in the wrong direction or I have them set to the wrong levels for the top and bottom. And either of those things you can flip it and fix, or once you've drawn the stair, you can edit the instance properties and fix those things. So don't worry if you're off a little. It's pretty easy to fix those things and get them sort of adjusted the way we want. OK, next up is the whole notion of actually you know, creating stairs that are a little more complex than this. The idea is the single stair, that's pretty straightforward about what's going on, but quite often we don't have enough room to have just like one long shot, or you may not want that, because it's kind of a, you know, it's a little architecturally not very interesting. Okay. So if you want to create a stair that has multiple segments, it's actually very similar. What I'm going to do is just go back to the Home tab, and I'll choose my stair tool again. And we're going to still draw a run line, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. And this time, I'm going to draw on out. But instead of stretching the full length, I'm going to keep track of that notion of how many I've created and how many are remaining. OK, this was a 16 riser stair. If I put about half of them down, then click, 
I've sort of broken it right there into one segment. I can now move over and draw another stair segment. Okay, and get the remainder of the stair right there. And if I do this, I'm going to create an L-shaped stair. If I close right now, it actually fills in. It puts this area in here, right there, and these lines right there. It's more boundary. That's creating a landing to the stairs. Okay, and that's generally a pretty good thing. You, it's nice just to be able to draw where the stairs will be and let it take care of the rest. You can sort of stretch that around a little bit. You can't do this. If you get too far there, it'll get all messed up because you sort of manage to draw something that doesn't actually make sense. So let me undo that. But if I create an L-shaped stair, it'll take care of putting the landing in there. Let's sort of see what that looks like. Let me Z-O, zoom out. Okay, so there's a little L-shaped stair right next to the uh, single shape. Okay. Other common shapes that you sometimes get into look like this. Oh, another really common shape is as follows. I'll have what I'll call a dog leg stair. It just goes up halfway. That's eight risers there. I'll come over here and I'll come back eight risers. Okay, and oh, as you go traveling around, you'll see this staircase all over the place. That's a very common one. Just Going up halfway, coming back. Going up halfway, coming back. Stuff like that. Okay, really common. Okay, so all these basic shapes are available. You can also create U-shaped stairs like we have here in Y2E2 just by breaking it into three segments. As you're drawing these shapes, there's only one gotcha I want to warn you about, and it looks like this. As you're drawing these shapes, what you have to watch out for doing is as follows. I'm going to draw one leg. When I'm placing the second leg, okay, what I'm actually doing is placing the center line of the second stair, not the edge of the second stair. So if you come like this and get really close in, you're creating a stair that's going to pinch. Okay, that's not good. Okay, so yeah, what you always got to be aware of is that you're placing the center line and give yourself enough breathing room so that it'll be able to create a proper landing between them. So I don't want to do that. Let me undo. And instead, I'll draw another run line, just giving it some separation. Angles are fine. Finish that stair. Oh, that's interesting. It's saying that I don't have the right number of risers. Let me take a look why. Oh, I still need two more. So I actually need to go even a little bit further. Now I have minus one remaining. <laughs> I've gone a little too far. Now I'll pull it back. Okay, so go ahead and make your multi-leg stairs. And I don't know, you generally do pretty good with that. Ramps, it turns out, are very, very Actually, Let me go let's see if I skip something there. No, that's fine. Ramps are very similar to stairs. Let's just talk about ramps real quickly. Ramps are an awful lot like stairs. You sort of say the top and bottom level. The big difference is they just don't have the risers and the treads. They're sort of a continuous slope that's going up. A couple of kind of gotchas you have to worry about when you're doing ramps, though. And they are as follows. Let me go back to that first floor. I'll open my ramp tool. You'll find it right above the stairs. You'll see that you still have this whole idea of riser or riser li or run lines, and you have boundaries, all that stuff. It's still sort of available to us. Okay, but what's a little bit different about ramps is as follows, and you'll see it in the type properties for the ramp. Ramps are bounded by some sort of notion. Let me edit the type of the maximum slope, and that's really typically set by code. You can only have ramps slope up so much. In this case, it's one inch of rise for every 12 inches of run. OK, that's one way of describing it. Some people will describe that as like 2% or they give a percentage or an angle to it. But 1 in 12 is sort of a very common way to describe it. And the idea is the ramp can be shallower than that, but it can't be any steeper. Because if it was any steeper, it would actually be a little bit of a hazard if someone was rolling on down in a wheelchair 
or on their rollerblades or whatever, they're going to pick up some speed and maybe just uh, get out of control. Okay, so there's a maximum. Uh, hmm? Exactly. If you're really, if you're trying to look for trouble, ramps are a good way to go ahead and create it. Ramps are actually a little bit confusing in that sense. So we have the issue of how the what the maximum slope is. We also have this notion of the maximum incline length. And it's really very closely related. If I have a 100-foot ramp that's kind of sloping, I sort of have that same problem where about halfway down and you're still rolling and there's no place for it to stop and level off, you might just start picking up speed and getting out of control. So they like this idea of, and it's again dictated by code, there's a maximum length you can take a ramp before you actually have to have a flat spot and take a break. Okay, And that's typically 30 feet. So as you're defining ramps, here's the hard part. Given that 1 in 12 rule, if you really have to get up 9 feet, okay, so kind of think about that. For every 1 inch, every 108 of those inches, okay, you're going to need 108 feet to make that ramp work. Okay, so that's a long ramp. So what does that look like? If I start drawing my 108 foot ramp, It'll come up. It's going to let me do 30 feet. Then I'm going to have to stop. I can double back. I can double back. Oops, a little more, 15 more feet. There we go. OK, that's enough ramp to actually get up 9 feet. OK, that's why you don't often see ramps kind of as the primary way to get between floors. You see them in garages, okay, where would they actually be steeper? There we're allowed to be because cars can handle a little bit better. Okay, you'll see it at like uh, sports arenas and stuff like that. But the key they use there is they make them very wide and circular, typically, so that if you put a big enough radius on it, you can actually get an awful lot of length, okay, in a small area. Okay, but ramps in general are a challenge. So uh, yeah. It's much more common, rather than going ahead and having ramps going up from one level all the way up to a second level. Let me kind of zoom in there and kind of show you what that ramp looks like. Oh, I'll take off its railings just so you can sort of see it. Okay, Rather than having rail ramps go all the way from floor level to floor level, you tend to see them in smaller places. They go from three feet up here on the terrace to get on down. You know, you don't have a big ramp that runs all the way from the upper level here all the way down to the lower level at the engineering center because it it would just be a big, long, dangerous kind of obstacle. Okay, so use ramps judiciously, but define them very much like you do stairs. Okay, to finish out our little is this issue is stairs. Let's go back to the first floor view, and we've been talking a lot about this issue of the run line and what it's good for, but. Let's give you a little bit of architectural flexibility now. Because you know, it's not just about sort of getting the basic stair in there. You have to get that happening. But let's say you want to give the stair a little bit of style. How could you do that? Let me take that very basic stair and I'll edit it. Okay, And this is where it starts getting fun, because the flexibility you have is almost infinite. Okay, For example, there's that boundary line over there on the side. It's have a nice straight boundary line. If I don't want to have a nice straight boundary, I can go ahead and pretty easily go through and start changing it up. Give it a nice sloping boundary. And can I have now a very dramatic stairway that starts very grand and kind of narrows towards the top. That's more like the Paris Opera House or something like that. Okay. Or if I go back to that first floor view, we do stairs that look like this. It's always a little bit weird. I think they're hard for people to walk up. I could just flare it that way, or I could even sort of follow it this way. Okay, but I can go through and create any sort of shape I want to the boundary. And create some interesting architectural effects. So think about if that's going to be a useful technique to you. It doesn't have to be going up in a single direction. We could go over here, then double back that way, too. Now, not only can you go ahead and play with the boundary on the stair runs, but you can also play with the boundary on the landings. So think about how you might be able to use that. For example, oh, here's my favorite guy over here. It's this little like dog leg stairway. 
Okay, dog leg stairway. It's going up one way. It's going back the other. Oops, I got the railing. Pardon me. Let me get the staircase. Edit the sketch. Okay, it's got this flat boundary over here. It's very tight. You know, you go up the stairs. You can't really hang out very much on this balcony right here at the edge because it's sort of, you know, it's just there. You're going to be in the way of anyone sitting or, you know, trying to pass. If you want to put a place to sit halfway up the railing or have a place for people to stand and wave to the people below, whatever you want to have happen there, you can stretch that boundary out if you like. You can make it an extra big landing. Or you can even go through and change the shape of the boundary, make it a curve or make it some sort of circular thing or whatever it is you have in mind. And when you finish that, okay, now I got a big old landing. Okay, and you can see now back over here at the back side of the curve, you've really created a little bit of an architectural space. You could actually use that, put some benches or seats or something like that over there. And the stairs is actually being very nice. It's doing a very good job of kind of continuing the railing and taking care of all that stuff for you. So. Go ahead and think about changing the boundaries. Okay. The other thing you can do is if you want to change the stair around, you might think about changing the risers. You could actually start thinking about changing those shapes too. And let's talk about what that would look like. So here I am. I'm at the bottom of my stair right here. Let me zoom on in. I'll edit that again. So right now I've got these little straight risers, nothing very special going on there. If I want to, I can go through and put on, and I have to actually choose the riser type of line. It's the third of the choices there. I will, I took out the last riser because I have to have the same number of risers. I can go ahead and make a big rounded end to that stair. The second one over here, again, I have to always kind of keep the same number of risers, so I'll take out a riser. And then I'll draw another one right here. Oops, it keeps on switching back to boundary. I need to keep on switching itself back to, ri to riser. Oh, I got the straight line. That's not what I wanted. Let's try again. Riser, arc. Here, here, pull on down. So as I go finishing my stairs, I can kind of create really whatever I want. So I want you to play around with stairs. Have some fun with it, because they don't just have to be these sort of very kind of boring, straight segments. You could actually start coming up with all sorts of interesting shapes to them. Okay. You OK on shapes? Beautiful. Let's go ahead, have you pop up, do your five minute stand and stretch. When you come on back, we're going to stop talking about the shape of the stairs. And we're actually going to look at the materials properties and the railing properties so that you know, given that shape, we can actually kind of really get a lot closer to sort of the dynamic things you have in mind. Okay, make sense? Okay, let's go ahead and break and come on back. Let me go back in and we'll address some questions. <laughs> okay, one question that came up is, hey, I've got this really nice looking stair. Can I easily copy and paste that up to the next level or up to two or three different levels? And the answer is yes. It's really just a big old object. And this is actually something that's going to work for any of your different objects. If you've created objects on level one and you want to create them, copy them to level two or level three, and really put them right on top of each other, kind of kind of stack them up there, what you do is as follows. You just choose the object that you want. Okay, Let me show you there's actually sort of two modes of copying. There's this copy tool. This copy tool is all about, it's next to move. It sort of takes it and moves it over sideways. It moves it laterally, but keeps it at the same level. Okay, And okay, that's often what we want to do in floor plan views. There's this other tool over here, which of course is also called copy, but it's actually copy to the clipboard. Okay, And copying to the clipboard is what I want to do in this case. Because if I can get it on the clipboard, then I can do this thing called pasting it aligned. And let's think about what that's good for. If I have something on level one and I want to paste it to level two and paste it to level three, okay, I could put it right back in the same place. Sometimes that's useful when I have two objects and I'm going to kind of change each of them a little, but I want them to be in the same place. But the most common thing I do is I select levels 
and I can choose any of the different floor levels. I can go ahead and put it up on the second floor level. In fact, I could even put it up on the roof level too. And when I do that, let me zoom on out. You'll see I've actually created three of them. So that's how you go ahead if you want to, you know, you have your stair and you've really done a lot of very custom things to it. And it works for almost any object that you want to do that to. Yes? Yes, it'll copy on the clipboard. Okay, yes. Yes. Well, actually, in, so when you come back over, when you're in the other project, let's just try it. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm game. Let's come over here. It's on the clipboard, right? We think we're good. So we'll take, create another project. Say okay. Okay, let's try this. It's on the clipboard. I think it's going to find it under modify. And there's paste. Okay, and there we have it. And now we have it to kind of copy around and do what we want to do in this project instead. Okay, so clipboard's very handy. Often, yeah, you had something you really like in the last project, but you want to bring it forward, the clipboard will carry it. Okay, let me switch my windows back over. Close up that one. Okay, let's talk about these stairs some more. Okay, these stairs by default have been created using, it's kind of this default type. It's a stair that has these treads, it has risers to it, and it has these little kind of outside pieces here that are, oh, I think of them as stringers or carriages. But let's go ahead and kind of, I'll call them stringers for now. I'll think of the correct word for that in just a second. If I choose a stair, it has types. The same way almost everything has types, and you can choose different types. So I can choose to have something that's open on one side. It's a little hard to see where that, that opened it up on the other side. Let me pan it over there so you can sort of see what I mean. This is what an open stair looks like. It's open now on what you think of as the right side. It's closed on the left side. Okay, so. It either has that board that's containing the stairs or doesn't. I can choose it and say make it open on both sides. Uh, I can go through and say let's make it an open riser stair. Okay, that's one where there are no risers. We're just sort of looking at the treads. We can say that, you know, I want an open riser stair, but I actually just want to have the middle stringer that actually has a single big element right down the middle supporting this. We can move the railings too. And we'll talk about that in a second too. Yes, they're, at this point they're a little hanging out there in space. So then we need to fix that. And finally, the last type of stair you want to play around with is this oh, monolithic stair. Monolithic stairs are all about like big concrete poured stairs. It's made out of a single material for all the different surfaces. Okay. Could not be concrete material for the monolithic stairs. What's that? Could not be concrete. It could not be concrete. It could yes, it could not be concrete. It could be some other material too. It's so whatever is going to structurally make sense. Okay. So we can go through and change our stairs to different properties. But let me show you that. Not only can we choose these existing types, like most things I keep telling you about, there's always a way to create your own types. And how that almost always works is we'll go to the type properties. I'll do a little duplicate. Oh, let's say open riser, and we'll say uh, stone treads. So. By default, you see that the tread is currently set up to be this wood sherry. The stringer's made of wood sherry. If I want to have, start to have different stairs that have a different material for the flat surfaces, what I can do is choose. Oh, let me go ahead and change it to stone. Okay. 
can I can start having different materials, really to kind of create whatever effect you want. Again, this just looks like a solid black, but when we start rendering, these materials choices will be very important to us. Okay? So we can change the aspects of a stair. Let's kind of go back and take a look at some of the other sort of properties that are available, because materials are one thing. Yeah, we're still there. Okay, so I can change those things. I can change all sorts of things about the stringers, what the material is, whether it has a stringer on the left or right, um, whether there's a left, a middle, a right. Oh, what else do I want in here? For the risers, I can talk about what type of riser it is. Right now it has no risers, but it could have a straight or a slanted riser. I'll show you what that looks like. a little hard to see in this view. What could I do? Let me cut a stairway uh, or, or a section through the stair and you'll be able to see that a little bit better. View, let me cut a section through it. Okay, that's a slanted riser stair right there versus if I edit that type, edit the type properties. This is, where's my risers? That's a straight riser stair. There's even this funny thing of the nosing on the treads. Right now the nosings have this little one inch radius. Do you have anything else in there? We'll do that, let me see. Even a little bit bigger and fatter or something like that. I can go ahead and change the, the, the tread thickness. So instead of being a one inch tread, oh, it's a three inch tread or something like that. So I can change the properties of the stairs quite a bit. And you'll start playing with these things really to create whatever effect you want. Two of the critical properties though you want to pay attention to is this issue of the maximum riser height and the minimum tread depth. Because this is this whole thing about the steepness of the stair. The maximum riser is how high we can go in an individual step. Seven inches is what it's set to for right now. If you want to have a stair that's a little bit steeper, just go ahead and change that. You can make it eight inches. That would still be to code. If you go to nine inches, you're outside of code, but it might be sort of some specific effect you want to try and create. That would have to be a secondary stair. It couldn't be the primary stair. You, but you can have ladders in addition to stairs. Okay. We also have the minimum tread depth. If you want stairs that aren't quite 11 inches because you don't have room, you could start compressing that, and make that a little bit smaller, and make the overall stair longer. This is also where you find the issue of this calculation between the two. And here's where you see there's this two times the rise plus one times the depth, giving us 25 inches. And by default, we tend to leave this rule alone. That's a good relationship to have. But again, if you have a special case, you can go ahead and change things. A lot of times, I end up modeling a lot of historical buildings where these relationships just aren't true. So I have to turn these things off, OK? Because a lot of older buildings don't meet modern codes. Let's go back to the code today. Yes? Ah, it's in these type properties. And it's just way at the very tippy top. No worries. Okay, let me say okay to that. Let me go ahead, I'm gonna change it so the maximum riser height is eight inches now. And I'll zoom on out. I'm gonna go back to the, like, uh, the floor plan view. Show you what the effect of that is. You remember over here, this stairway was done with the maximum riser height being seven inches, so it required, I think, 16 risers to make that stair. Now that we're allowing that we have a different type of stair that has a higher height available when I go through and create the stairs. It won't change an existing one. It'll leave the existing one alone because it's really a maximum for what you can put in there. But if I choose, oh, where are my stair properties? I always have to find them. That's just the line properties. There they are. I will choose, what have I been messing with? I think I was messing with the open riser stone treads. Okay. So now the desired number of risers is 14. Ah, it's less risers because it's allowing it to go up higher than uh, seven inches. 
So now when I draw this new staircase from here on back, you'll see I can actually accomplish the same height, but just in less distance. Okay, so there's a whole art to stairs and steepness and stuff like that. And in general, you kind of try to have to, it's, it's kind of a little iterative process. You sort of plan some space, you see if you can get a fit stair to fit. If you can't get the stair to fit, we'll have to increase the space or maybe think about a slightly different configuration to get it in there. But stairs can be a real challenge. Of all the things you put into a building, roofs and stairs, those are without a doubt the biggest problem yeah, issues because it's just, uh, there's a lot of complex geometry to consider there. Yes? Yes, it's that yeah. You know, all you mean in terms of the nosing radius or something like that, or which one? Say again. Nosing, nosing family of railings. Of railings? Oh no, railings! I'll show you. Railings are good. Railings, we actually we're going to define them. You could transfer them from another project, but in the same way we've been messing around with the stairs, let's show you how to mess around with railings. Yes, those railings that are in there right now. Oh yeah, they're pretty boring, aren't they? Mm. Exactly. Oh no, we can do better than that. Please, you know we can do better than that. Okay, so here's the steel. Here's this one railing over here. Oh, you know, you're going, ugh, I don't like this at all. It's, it's handrail ver rectangular. Okay, let's try. The other one that's predefined is this handrail pipe. Let me try and change it to that. Handrail pipe, a lot of people like better. It's sort of more modern. It's sort of made of uh, pipes. It's very similar to the rail that's out here, but it's not quite. It's not like, yeah, you know, it's a still a little bit thick. This is actually very industrial looking, all those big pipe rails and stuff like that. So if we want to create a new railing with a new type, what do we do? Well, like we do, you, you know, it's, it's like the old record. You know, oh, well, how about we'll open the type properties and duplicate it? So let's go ahead and do that. We'll open type properties, and we'll duplicate this. I'm going to come up with a type of railing that I actually kind of like. And it's called a cable rail or something like that. OK, and let me show you what it is. It's actually, there's this fantastic material I like. It's on this funny little bracelet I wear all the time. It's actually, it's wire rope. It's just twisted wire fibers or something like that. But it's actually a very cool material, and we use it a lot for railings. It's very thin, but very strong. So what happens is, uh, if you put it as a railing, it's, it's like it, there's very little visual weight to it. You can sort of see right past it. So it's nice when you need a nice open view, something like that. It'll still meet the requirement of providing a barrier every four inches so we meet the code requirements. People can't accidentally push through the railing, okay, but it's just a different material. So if I wanted to create a railing like that, or think about a railing made of glass. That's a very common thing. As you travel around the world, it's you know glass railings that just have a top uh, kind of handrail to them. Very, very common. Very nice. It provides a safety. It gives you a nice visual openness. Okay, so let's think what that would look like. This whole issue of the railing is defined here. There's two big pieces, the rail structure and the baluster, or the vertical member placement. Let me start with just the rail structure, because that's sort of probably the easier one to understand. It's made up right now of a series of different pieces, rail one through six, starting at three feet high. Okay? The upper one is something that's an inch and a half big. The lower one right now, our lower ones are all one inch, which is, that's a little fat. That's a little chunky for what I have in mind. I want something a little thinner. So I can, in this new rail that I'm defining, I can assign a material. For example, oh, maybe for my material, you know, like in Y2E2, as opposed to being this big piece of painted metal, maybe I'd like it to be nice wood. You know, so I can make it like a cherry wood, or I can make it like a bamboo like we have here, whatever you like. Okay. And now that top rail is going to be a slightly different material from the lower rails. I can apply that, although we probably won't see much difference back there until I turn it away. Okay. Now for these lower ones, I'd like to make that a little smaller, but my choices only right now are an inch or inch and a half. Hmm. So I'm not finding what I want. I really want something that's only about a quarter inch, something like that. Okay. So here's what I got to do. I'll say, okay, you know, I can't do what I want exactly that. Let me just kind of close this away, put it away. Okay, well, at least I, I do have my uh, top rail. It's wood, but I don't have the bottom of it fixed up yet. What I need to do is I need a profile that's a quarter inch circle. I got an inch circle and I got an inch and a half circle. I need a quarter inch circle. So what I'll do is the profiles are actually listed as one of the families. 
We'll go to Profiles. And there's that circular handrail profile. I can open the one inch profile. It's a type. If I don't like that type and I want something with slightly different dimensions, I'll just dupe it. Put a quarter inch in there. Give it the new dynamiter. Say OK. So now I have a new profile to work with. With that new profile, now I can go back and in the railing use that profile to create the thin elements that I have, the little wire elements. So I'll come back over here. I'll edit the properties over here. And now I can say, make that that smaller quarter inch instead. I can leave them the default material or choose a different material. Maybe I'll leave the very lowest one quarter inch. Now, you might notice that actually this is more than four inch gaps in here. So I probably should actually go through and add a few more rails and fix it. But I'll leave it like that for right now. OK. OK. So, ah, OK, now I have my kind of slightly thinner rail that I like. Eh, you know, I don't like the look of that lower rail. Hmm. Let's take a look at that. Type properties, you know, and it just it didn't look right to me. What do I have in there? Got some big old pieces. Nothing I'm really liking too much. Nah, let me just make it small in the meantime. Okay, so if I like that rail, I can apply it to this side of the staircase too. I can apply it to this side of the staircase and just go to town. Now let's think about this. In terms of transferring this to other projects, because if you like your favorite rail, you might want to kind of carry it with you and kind of take it other places. I could go ahead and copy this staircase out and paste it into another project. And actually, the rail will come with it, because it'll bring the type as part of the rail, and it'll carry its type. The other way would be doing that transfer project standards thing. I could sort of go and say, let me get all the railing types and pull them apart. So either way will work. So you never have to worry about having to recreate something. If you really, if you have something and you like it, find it, and then we'll find a way to copy it in. Yes? Yes? Oh, which one? This one over here? Let me, get, let me get rid of some of these so we can actually see. Yes. Let me get rid of some of these. The one down here? Oh, let me get that. Oh, you mean the one that's, that's kind of hanging in space? Undo again. That was my little like short example. But if, go ahead and ask the question again. Tell me what you're what you're after. Is it something and you raise the railing? Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. So if, if the railing gets erased, oh, that thing. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and see if we can come up with an example of that. Not that one. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, this one over here. There we go. Yeah. Well, what can we do about that? Let's kind of think. Let me open that up on two sides. I'll just make it really bad. Actually, that is a space rail. It's just a little hard to see. Okay. Let's take a look at that. And what we'll do is, what it's actually doing is it's actually following it's the profile of the piece that's not there, whether you can sort of see that or not. What I got to do is as follows. For this railing, one thing I can do is, um, I'm trying to think, is it its instance properties? No, I think I have to edit its type. Is kind of play with this issue of really where the balusters are relative to the edge of the stairs. Right now, they're sort of outside the edge of the stairs. Let me go ahead and bring it inside, and that should help out a little bit. OK. 
that at least is getting them over. That's a little bit better, but let's see how well we did. They may still be floating a little high. Oh, you're right. Well, we better fix that too. And again, we'll edit the rail properties. And this is where you have to sort of get everything in alignment with each other. If the balusters are going to be in two inches, then the rail also has to be in two inches. Now, this is actually one of those funny things where you can have different pieces. If you actually look at our railings out here in Y2E2, where the railing is and where the handrail is, the handrail is actually sort of inset a few inches from the, uh, the vertical elements. But you can go ahead and kind of mess with this and play with it. There's always some way to kind of get what you want. It just kind of takes a lot of attention to the details. Okay. But Think creative about railings because it could be these verticals, it could be these horizontals, but think about, you know, again, a profile. If you want a glass railing, think about a long profile, which is, you know, it could be made up of this very tall, skinny profile, which is going to be a piece of glass on top of which you're going to put some sort of handrail or something like that, and that's going to be just fine. That'll work as a glass railing or something like that. Yeah. Be creative. It, you know, things don't have to look like these little pickets that are kind of hanging around all over the place. Okay, so I'll let you kind of play with that a little bit. But that's definitely it's one of your design variables. You don't have to sort of have the same old boring railings. And especially if it has some fantastic view, you may not want to block it with a lot of railings. Okay, let's give you a last few things to worry about. There's the ever popular spiral staircase or curved staircase. And that's really just a variation on a theme. I think you'll get that one real easily. If I want to create a spiral staircase, I say stair. I'm just going to have a round run line. Okay. And I can have, oh, a very broad arc like that, which will give us sort of a very open stair. Or I can go through and have oh, a very narrow stair. Again, round. But I'm just going to go like that and bring it around. Okay, Even that, uh, that's still looking too broad for me. That dimension that it's putting down is actually it's this, the run line dimension. Or it's the dimension to where the run line's measured. Let me go ahead and get rid of some of this stuff. I'll make it even tinier still. I think that'll do it. That's more like a spiral stair. Now the only rule when you're creating spiral stairs that you have to watch out for is they can't sweep more than 360 degrees. Okay, And it's really just a drawing thing. You can't draw on a line on top of a line. It gets the system confused. So here, exactly, exactly. So it's really just different objects. If you need to go around 360 or 720 or whatever, you just create one and you kind of copy the one on top of the other. Yeah, you know, just kind of break it into separate little segments and then kind of copy and adjust and twist. No worries, that actually works just fine. So spiral stairs, they tend not to be bad. Again, yeah. 360 is your limit, but go ahead, and if you need more than 360, do it in several segments. I'll go to level 1 to level 1 plus 6 feet. Then I'll go from level 1 plus 6 feet up to level 2. You know, I can go ahead and sort of break it and use the offsets to go ahead and create whatever you like. Okay, That's good. Da -da -da. What else is there? We will finish off with just the whole issue of the floor openings and how the floors relate to these things. because. We do have that issue still to address, and that'll kind of wrap us up for most of what we're doing today. Here's the scoop. I'll go up to my second, well, I'll go to the first floor. Actually, as long as I'm in here, let me just go ahead and uh, move some of these stairs into the underneath the floor level. Oh, I want to do it the other way. Okay, we'll do that. Let me go ahead and I'll grab this one over here. Same thing, I can sort of move it over here. 
I'll leave that one kind of hanging around on the edge, and maybe I'll get rid of some of this junk. Clutter, clutter, clutter. Oh, and my ramp, as much as I love my ramp. So we got these different stairs, they're kind of poking on up. The problem is we need to kind of cut some openings, otherwise we're going to have this trouble where you know, people are going to hit the floor. That's not good. So here's what we got to do. We're going to go up to the second floor level. Zoom on out. If I edit the floor boundary, I can see my stairs, and I am ready to start cutting holes. How do I cut my holes? I can either draw boxes or I can pick the edges. So I got some very weird looking sort of things going on there. Okay. I can come all the way out to there. Let me trim that up. I'm not sure what I got going on in that stair. I think I have two very weird type of rails. I could finish the floor and we're kind of okay. Same thing over here for the uh, circular staircase. I can pick some edges, maybe the outside edge over here, maybe the top of the stair. It's always a little bit hard to guesstimate or estimate really where it is where the other sort of piece should come, especially with circular stairs. I'll show you how to fix it with uh, straight stairs. Circular stairs are a little bit harder to guesstimate. The idea is as follows. You, know, you don't need to open up the entire space above the stairs typically. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you even need to have more than the stairs. It all depends on headroom and how steep the stair is. Okay? But let me finish those and we'll take a look and see how we did. Okay. What I want to check is over here on the stairway on this side, the question, did I leave enough headroom for the stair or not? Okay, because if I have more than enough, I can pull the floor back in and give a little bit more usable floor area for these guys. If it's not enough, I need to sort of make the opening bigger. Either way. And how you have to do that is as follows, or at least one way to do that that I like to use is to just use a section. So I'll grab a section. I'll just draw a section right through the stairs. And again, this is one that I'm probably not going to put on my finished sheets, but it's one that I'm going to use just for my own internal design checking. I can take a look at that stair. And I got my stair, I got the floor, but I'm not quite sure if I got nine or six foot eight or 80 inches, which is what I need to allow for myself. So here's how I can check this. And this is an example of just sort of using construction lines to sort of temporarily measure something. What I'm going to do is actually go to the annotation tools, which is where I just have lines and things that I draw in a view to kind of help myself, either to explain things or just help to measure things. I'm going to grab the detail lines. They don't really have any meaning. They're just a line in this view. And I'm going to sort of basically draw a line just from the top or the nose of one tread out to the nose of another tread. That's just the line of the stair or the slope of the stair. With that line in place, I can then say move. And I'll move that line 80 inches or 6 foot 8 up. So that's the line of where six foot eight fits. So you see that actually I could go ahead and probably move that in like another foot or something like that, get a little more usable area. Because what I'm looking at, that's the edge of the floor. That's where that line is that it has to cross or that it can't cross. So I could go ahead and push that floor in a little bit. Now the 80 inches, that's all about you know, what happens when a tall person is walking down. And it used to be what was considered tall. Six foot two used to be a tall person. Nowadays, tall people are six foot eight and things like that. So, yeah, six, that's about what, what's right for like what I'm walking on down. That's what the code says right now. It's about 80 inches. If it's shorter than that, you know, when you walk down, you hit your head. You keep on doing that all the time. And a lot of older houses, you do that. You have a question, Aaron? You're stretching. You're just stretching. Okay, let me go back to the second floor level. I can sort of guesstimate that I can move that in a little bit. I don't want to move it too awfully far. Be aggressive, but not so aggressive that you're going to be chopping the heads off of the six foot four people. They got rights and privileges too. It must be a different section. Yep, there it is. Ooh, pretty good guess. <laughs> okay, so 
you use that. Much harder to do for a circular stair. For a circular stair, you actually have to sort of figure out how to cut, you know, and approximate which level it is, because it's really kind of a curving surface. You can still do it, but you might have to do it in two or three different sections to figure out really what it is, you know, or where it is happening. You know, I'd have to do Oh, I'll draw a section in here. Can make a section or a no, flat. you can't. That'd be a cool view, but we don't have it. That'll sort of work. This will at least sort of check at that one point where I've currently drawn it. So I can now try to measure in here like what the distance is at that one's point. So the annotation tools. Is it under modify? It's under modify now. I can measure, and I can actually try measuring, oh, from this floor point up to here. What do I have? And it looks like I have only about six foot four or something like that. I can't tell. I think I'm in trouble. So I probably need to go ahead and make that a little bit wi uh, wider. Okay, so cut your floor openings. That should be okay. And where we'll finish off today is on this funny notion of once you've cut your openings, we're doing pretty good, except for the fact that people walking around up on the second level can fall right into that hole, and that's probably not a good thing either. In fact, they're not doing so good about the edge of the balcony either, so I think we better fix some of those issues. So how do you add railings? And you've defined railings. We've gotten pretty good about what's going on there. We just need to add them around the hole and around the edge. Stairs, super. They came for free as part of the stair. Excellent. Okay. When we need to add them and they're not for free, what you do is as follows. You go up to the second floor or wherever you need to put them. Let me zoom on in. Here's the deal. We are going to put some railings all around this opening, not across the front here, but all around the three sides. Okay, you can sort of see the hole in the floor and what we're trying to guard against. Railings are just another tool. And railings, like most other tools, we define by drawing a line, and then it'll put a railing in that place. What I'll do, I'm going to actually use the pick tool, because the pick tool is sort of an easy way to follow that. I'll give it an offset of like four inches. We tend not to put railings right on top of the edge of the hole. We actually sort of put them a little bit outside. And I'll show you why in just a second. Okay. Then I can trim those things up. I'm going to use TR as my shortcut for trimming. Okay. Now, as you create the boundary of the railing, it typically isn't a complete loop, because then it's hard for people to get into the space. Okay. But it does have to still be like a continuous line. Okay. So you can't have separate segments. I'll finish that railing. Say OK and then we're doing okay. Now, oh, in the same sort of sense, let's go ahead and I don't like that railing very much. I like the new one we defined, so let's use it instead. Come on over here. Come on over here. Yeah, I need to make my opening a little bit bigger. In that case, so I goofed on my floor opening. Let's go ahead and edit that. I'll make it a little bit bigger. That moved the railing? Not, that actually just moved the floor opening. I didn't lock it. If I would have locked it nicely, then I would have been okay. Let me edit the path of the railing. Same sense here, I'll take that one out. Let me do the offset on the other side, zero foot four. And there's the edge of my floor right there. Okay, let me do the trim. And we'll finish that up. Okay, now we're doing pretty good. We're not quite there yet. You might notice that we still have this little goofy problem, oh, right up here at the edges where they're not quite joined with each other. Okay, but no worries, we'll fix that real quick. Okay, if we want to join those things together, and it's actually sort of a very common thing we have to do. Actually, notice I didn't change that one right either. Okay, 
When you want to join those together, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the second floor plan. And you can actually sort of see this happening right here. We have the railings. We have that railing there. We want to join the two together. What I'm going to do is take that railing. I'm going to edit its path. And what I'm going to do is actually just add some more segments to it. I'm going to leave, turn on chaining, because I'm going to actually put three different segments in there. I'm going to go move over here, then move on back. And I'm actually going to do, let me unchain that. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Come on out, come on over, and bring it back. Okay, That's just a little return. Mm, off a little on my geometry. I should go back and fix that. But it creates things like this where it sort of puts that last little leg in there and tries to mire it all in there and make it look very nice. Okay. Now, this is actually an example of something that's sort of hard to do, so I'm going to encourage you to sort of let go of it a little bit as you're working, at least on this first iteration of this assignment. Getting all your railings to come together and miter perfectly turns out it's a really hard thing, even if you've been doing this for a long time, to kind of get just the right location of the line and to try and get that 100% perfect. Okay, As you're working, especially as a part of a preliminary design, you know, if it's here and it's off by two inches, that's probably OK, at least for the first level of design of trying to understand your design and whether it's meeting my requirements and stuff like that. Later, you know, when we get further on down, we'll have to fix that for the construction details and really make sure that's really quite precise. But I want to encourage you, don't go ahead and worry about every last inch if you don't even have buy-off on the feet. Okay, so always go ahead and kind of think about really at what level of detail you are. Because it's, you know, we could spend another half an hour trying to get that thing really to match up exactly right. But is it really worth it? You know, if it turns out we're not even going to go with that stair, that stair is going to move halfway across the floor, maybe it wasn't worth all that time to get a perfect model. We go through and we create all our different model views. You've got to think about where you are in the process and really what kind of questions people have that you have to get them over to, to get to the next that level. So often we're at the preliminary design phase, so what people really want to know is Basically, is this meeting my requirements? Can I, is it possible to build it? Can I afford to build it? There's some very basic things. At this level, they don't really kind of care about the precise construction details. You know, three months from now, when we're bidding it out, they're going to care about all those details. But for right now, they just want to sort of even understand it at a high level. So as you think about the types of things you want to provide them and the views you want to provide them, you got to start to think, OK, if really all you really want to know is does it meet my requirements, they kind of want to know, well, what are you showing me? OK, so floor plans, maybe some elevations. Even things like just notes and tags are very, very useful. Because when you look at that big rectangular thing on the floor, you know, you may know what it is because you designed it. But as they're looking at it, you know, they'll be embarrassed to say, you know, what is that thing? Is that a rug? Is it a coffee table? Is it my dining table? A lot of time they won't know. OK, so putting little notes can be very, very helpful, especially if you're just going to draw things and you don't have time to fully model things in 3D, it's OK to draw on the floor plans and sort of add notes to explain things. And that's OK. Yes? How do you add the tags? You just put some there and Yeah, actually, the tagging is yeah, it's under the annotation. And we'll sort of explore this next time. We can add text. OK, and just put things on. Just very nicely kind of add text to our views. Later, as we go further, you know, they'll want to know how big it is. We'll want to put dimensions on things. You know, also, in terms of how big it is, it's very helpful to put the furniture in. Because often, you know, people have a very hard time. If you say the bedroom's 14 by 14, they won't know what that means. But if you say, oh, there's a king size bed, and they can sort of see, oh, that looks kind of tight for getting around, they'll have a much better sense of what that means. So that's why you like to put the furniture and the context in there. It's just to help them answer questions. Okay. And then as you're working, especially let's think, let's think about this assignment, assignment two. You know, I want you to really start thinking about choosing views that are selling your design. Okay, really, you know, what is it that you really need to convey? Because there's this funny issue of less is actually more. If you go ahead and give me 12 sheets that have 100 different views of your model, okay, you know, 
like with my slides. After about the 20th one, you're like, oh my god, your eyes have rolled back. You don't even know what, what was important anymore. There's so much information, you have a very hard time sorting it out. Your clients really want to look at this and really, you know, in five or six views, they want to understand it. The hundredth view doesn't really help them. So it's a really a game of choosing your views and putting the information there. Okay, even for your elevations, there's probably one or two elevations about this house that are really important that capture the view or really the architecturally strong ones. You know, do they really need an elevation of the carport? Maybe, maybe not. You know, so go ahead and choose the few views that are strongest. You know, use sections. If vertical relationships are very important, sections are very helpful to sort of understand because that's hard to see in a floor plan. But in a section, that's very easy to see. Use your camera views, you know, because those camera views are much more natural than looking at the flat views. And just really compose your sheets. Like what Charles would say is compose them because every individual view, it's not just sort of, you know, absolutely what's there. You get to sort of focus in and show it the way you want to show it because really, what you're trying to do is really motivate people. Either you want them to approve this design and take it to the next level, you want them to understand it better, but usually you're trying to get something. So always be thinking about your design communications and are, are they helping you or are you just adding more information to the equation that's not really going to help you sell your case? So yeah, be aware of that. Sometimes less is more. Okay, so choose your views, compose them. Next time we're going to spend a lot of time looking about all the different views. I've sort of been throwing elevations and sections and all those things. I think you have enough to get started with some of that. You know, a lot of you know how to place camera views in the drawings. You, if you're stuck with that, try to come to some of the office hours. We'll help you with those or ask questions about it. But you know, we'll try and get you through that. But use those views carefully. Yes. Thursday. Thursday. So it's going to be for Thursday night. You'll go ahead and have your first version of the model done in terms of what's going on. And then for the next week, we'll take that same model and continue forward with materials and lighting and rendering it and stuff like that. OK, let's go ahead and break for today. We'll see some of you upstairs in 199 for the others. Again, just take advantage of office hours to kind of fill in gaps. But get started with your designs and see if you can come up with something interesting. So Tuesday, we have some, some good stuff to look at together.